Rival Caesars by Desmond Dilg Chapter 1, Part 2 Nevertheless, our very failings may possibly act as brakes upon our idealisms, and thus perhaps save both of us from going to extremes. Perhaps you are right, was the reply, but talking of extremes, why should we not go to extremes if we desire to play a part in the great world drama? As I understand human nature, to go to extremes is ever symptomatic of genius and greatness. Weakness is to compromise, to hesitate, to be half-hearted. Are not the great names of ancient and modern times the names of haughty and aggressive personalities who carried their loves and convictions to extremes, that is to say, to logical and clean-cut conclusions? Mediocrity is safe. No doubt it is very commonplace and of a drab color. Mediocrity is for men of the secondary, the bloodless type. I do not believe it is in your makeup, and I am sure it is not in mine. Both of us, I am satisfied, feel the solid truth that is in the old saw, he who would be famous must go forth and risk his hide and hair. War, for example, is an extreme, and yet it is now and ever has been the first fountain of wealth and honor. Not for nothing has the highest meed of praise been granted to the successful soldier. But did you never think that a time might possibly arrive when war shall cease from off the earth, the lion lay down with the lamb, the tiger eat straw like a cow, and so forth, as those old Hebrew prophets pathetically affirm? said the wounded man with a suggestive smile. Never can that be, replied the other emphatically. Men were made for contending. The love of strife is in their very nature. It is born in them. All the higher and nobler families of men are warrior families and vice versa. Unfitness for war is unfitness for existence. History in our own eyes tell us this. What coward nation, for example, has either rights or privileges? A peaceful, acquiescent disposition in any man or nation is the great inefficiency. The lamb must never be food for the lion and the wolf. What else were lambs made for? However, it is quite possible for an age of cankering tranquility to settle down on the world for a time. But after all, it will only be as a passing interlude between lurid world blasts of conquest and carnage. As long as there is human rivalry and love, there must be war. Indeed, so long as two men desire the same territory or the same woman, there must be bloodshed and hatred, jealousy and war. Even your friendship and mine would scarcely stand such a strain as I've outlined. But to get back to business, the matter of a sworn compact between us, said the wounded man, I am agreeable to join you in this. The advantages of it are clear to me. Let us face the world together, shoulder to shoulder, and let us reduce the compact to writing and swear in the good old way of the brotherhood to which we already belong. Here is pen and ink and paper. You write first and sign. Then I will copy word for word what you write and also sign. Then you shall keep my signature and I yours. Word it after the penal obligation and model of the burning scroll. The speaker then drew his sword from the scabbard and leaned it point upwards against an open tome of blackstone. His friend proceeded to write, and this is what he wrote, to blank, I, A, blank, B, blank, without reservation or equivocation in the presence of this cup of blood and the iron sign of ING, do hereby and hereon solemnly and sincerely pledge myself unto life. Be no more to uphold your name, defend your fame, and promote your... And sincerely pledge myself until life. Be no more to uphold your name, defend your fame, and promote your material welfare at all times and upon all occasions, in sickness or in sorrow, in failure or in distress, in power or in glory. 
Furthermore, I do faithfully swear to stand by you in every danger, whether you be right or wrong, and never to divulge your secrets, nor aid your foes, nor consciously do you any injury whatsoever, nor believe or repeat any evil report about you, your wife, your children, or your family. Furthermore, I formally swear on my word of honor and seal and oath with my very heart's blood. Should I ever break this, my solemn obligation as a brother in blood of the holy ING, that you, A, H, are then at liberty to regard me as no longer your sworn friend, but your sworn enemy, and denounce me as no longer your sworn friend, but your sworn enemy, and denounce me as a perjured wretch before the iron altar of the Ing, and thereafter pursue me to the grave and beyond it with unrelenting hostility to the end of the end. Mortuum bellum. Signed and sealed in the presence of the above, A. H. From the veins of my heart, this blank, day of blank, 1775. A. B. The writer then cleaned the pen carefully, and drawing a small pocket knife from the fob, made a quick, deep incision through the skin of his left arm, according to the old formula, still in constant use. Dipping the pen into the rich red blood that ran from the puncture, he carefully signed his name in a bold, regular round hand. Then he took his sword, pushed it through the written paper, and handed the paper over the table to the wounded man, making at the same time the sign of fellowship with his left hand, saying, I la mut. Thereupon the wounded one took the ink and writing material across the table and copied the document, word for word. Then he wrote his own name in the blood that oozed through the bandage of the wounded arm and went through the same ceremony including the sign and repeating the penal word, I Lamut. The pen was then redipped in the blood of both men and ceremoniously dropped into a goblet of wine that stood on the center of the table. Whereupon each man arose, took up his sword in his left hand, rested the flat of it on the other's left shoulder. Then they drank the goblet of wine mixed with blood between them, repeating this toast one after the other and word for word. And trust me on my troth, if thou keep faith with me, my dearest friend, as my own heart, right welcome shalt thou be. Putting down the drained wine goblet, they then raised their naked swords aloft, and grasping each other by the right hand, swore the ancient symbolical oaths of Thurar, the oath without words. As the wounded man sat down again, he said, looking keenly across the table, as brethren of the blood, we are now bound to each other by the strongest bond that human hand and brain can bind. Henceforth we are not two but one. Ten thousand brains shall plot and plan to destroy one or both, should this ancient and binding pledge ever be broken or betrayed by one or by the other. Now I would suggest, as my arm is still somewhat painful, that we postpone further action until next Thursday evening at Judge Livingston's. In the meantime, we can think over the names of all those whom we might invite to join us. They should all be gentlemen and men of influence. We can possibly form a private revolutionary lodge of the Iron Cross, with you and I, unknown to the others perhaps, as the real moving spirits. I would think we could reckon upon Brockholst, Livingston, Rogers, Mason, Clinton, Troop, Fish, Tilgham, Ewing, Van Ranslayer, Pendleton, Van Ness, and young Roosevelt. Agreed, answered the other enthusiastically as he rose to go. We can and must combine to do things, but not with too many. We must chance our lives, I tell you, if we are ever to be successful and famous. If we fail, the fate of all failures shall, of course, be ours. But if we win, we literally win a kingdom. My good old grandfather wrote The Power of the Will, unquote, as his life's work. I will write The Will to Power is mine. Good or bad, I propose to be something great. I was never born to be a camp follower. The world as yet needs its conquerors, and I will be one of them. 
Ah, how grand to be absolute master and lord of over millions. Already I dream, yes. I dream of a beautiful queen afloat on the Hudson's tide, with warriors in golden sheen and Caesar by her side. Yes, replied the wounded man, laughing heartily. Your enthusiasm is quite infectious. Without doubt, the world is yet... Without doubt, the world is yet to Caesar. He is the conqueror. It is still hail, all hail, for the spoils of power and victory. Whoso would win great stakes must still play the iron game with iron nerve. You are right. Nothing changes but the hands on the dial. Human history is happen human history is but a record of what is about to occur it happens once more what happened of yore the glory and the failures of the past are all prophecies of the future exiles and outlaws for example founded the city of the seven hills exiles and outlaws men driven from europe founded these thirteen colonies whose stupendous futures shall yet surpass in good and in evil all that is recorded of imperial and republican rome there is before us in our posterity a glory, a power, and a grandeur greater than that of anything the mind of Plutarch's men could even conceive. Like you, I also have my daydreams, my castles in the air. I dream of an empire as great and prouder than Rome of old, with its temples and towers of fate. End of chapter one. Rival Caesars by Desmond Dill.